good afternoon everybody uh, on behalf of uh, the society for innovation and entrepreneurship or sign the business incubator here at iit bombay i welcome you all together with all of our collaborating uh, incubators today for today's session um, Today's session is um, uh, regarding uh, the Biotechnology Ignition Grant, and I will go into that. Uh, I'll give a brief overview on that. But uh, primarily what we are trying to do here today is we've got some prominent speakers in the domain to come talk to you as early stage innovators. And also with regards to the grant, many of them are uh, big reviewers. Uh, big is a short form for the Biotechnology Ignition Grant. And so many of them are big reviewers and can give you a clear perspective as to what is expected of you as agri-innovators or innovators in any other domain when you're applying for this grant. We are also lucky to have one of our uh, big grantees in this particular domain who will also share her experiences with you and give you uh, some insight on how to correct uh, or how to write a winning grant. Um, so I would just like to thank all of our participating incubators uh, here and introduce our um, speakers for today. So I'll uh, begin with the um, introduction of the speakers. First, uh, we'll have uh, participating today, Mr. Hemendra Mathur. He has over 25 years of experience in venture cap capital, private equity, management consulting, and investment banking in India. And his focus is agribusiness, and he has a lot of perspective coming from the investor side of things. Next, we have uh, Dr. Ram Narayan Ghatak. He is um, a trained um, agricultural economist who has um, a, a lot of years of experience in this domain in different roles. Currently, Dr. Ghatak is uh, the CEO of Indigram Labs Foundation, which is a reputed technology business incubator that was set up uh, with the support from the National Science and Technology Entrepreneurship Development Board under the Department of Science and Technology. And he, um, and he will provide um, his perspective on uh, what this, uh, with what the current uh, scenario in uh, the agri-domain, uh, the current scenario of innovation in the agri-domain is uh, from his experience with startups as well as being in this uh, domain for as long as he has. Next, we have Mr. Rajiv Ayappa. He's the Managing Director at Value Mark Private Limited. He, um, a platform that operates enterprises in the food uh, tech sector as an ingredient supplier to businesses as well as a B2B manufacturer of finished product. So he has um, he has been a startup mentor with us and with other incubators in the agriculture, food tech, clean tech sector for a long time. And uh, he has his vast experience in uh, mentoring such startups um, as well as uh, funding some, uh, some startups will help us today uh, get a perspective on that as well. Next, we have Dr. Vidya Gupta, who is a trained a scientist um, from NCL, and uh, her area of research is plant biochemistry and molecular biology. She has a rich history of publications and associations with prominent um, educational and academic institutions in the country. She won the Distinguished Women Scientist Award and uh, also an award, uh, and also several CSIR awards. It's a really ple a pleasure and a privilege to have her here uh, with us and provide her uh, perspective as a big um, reviewer as well as a scientist in this uh, field. We are lucky to have Dr. Parul here with us. She is our uh, big grantee uh, in the 17th cycle. She is a PhD in animal biotechnology from the National Dairy Research Institute. Uh, she is also the founding director of Boviage Research uh, LLP, which is uh, which is um, what is uh, through which she's carrying out her big project. I would like to talk a little bit. Uh, of course, she's also a Fulbright and Nehru Doctoral uh, Award, so she's a prime example of a woman scientist transitioning into an, uh, a successful woman entrepreneur. Hopefully. So through her uh, BIRAC big grant, Dr. Parul is working on uh, microRNAs that are associated with early pregnancy detection in cattle and buffalo. And uh, we can ask her uh, to elaborate a little bit on her innovation and how she came about it. Last but not the least, we have uh, Dr. Akshay Bhatt. As an entrepreneur by heart, uh, today he's representing Good Food India at this forum. As an entrepreneur by heart and scientist by training, he brings a unique blend of diverse and extensive scientific skills and business immersion spanning several years. 
He has a PhD in molecular biology from the National University of Singapore, and he co-founded Falcon Bio, a drug delivery startup creating smart bacteria with the ability to precisely localize and target solid tumors. Currently, he is uh, uh, at the Good Food Institute India, and he's uh, building their um, a smart protein research and innovation uh, e ecosystem there, and he will give us a unique perspective into what Good, Good, Good Food India does. Um, with that, I will share my screen uh, so that we can start today's session. Again, I will try to keep this very brief so that we have maximal time with our speakers and uh, interacting with the audience today. So again, uh, on behalf of SIGN, I thank all our participating incubators, um, our uh, big associate partners, uh, Punjab University, the Bioness at Punjab University, and our other ecosystem uh, part participating incubators who are here with us. We request all of uh, the people representing these particular incubators to post their information, the links to their website, and any other contact information in the chat box. For the rest of the participants, I request you to kindly refrain from posting anything in the chat box, any questions that you might have, please post it in the Q&A box so we can take it from there. If uh, uh, for the sake of time, we are unable to answer any questions that you've, you've posted, we'll make sure that we get back to you on that. So uh, once again, I thank you all of our participants uh, and uh, the participating incubators who've collaborated with us for this session. Now we are all here today because uh, the 21st cycle of BIRAC's Biotechnology Ignition Grant is currently open and it will close at 5.30 p.m. on the 16th of August. Now as an implementation partner for this grant, our job in this one and a half months is to bring as much information as we can about uh, this grant to you and uh, kind of promote the scope that this uh, grant has. And all of our speakers today will give you some perspective on the agri-domain, innovations in the agri-domain. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Mathur and Mr. Ayapar are coming from the industry side of things, and they've also mentored startups, and so they can give you their perspective on what the current uh, innovation scenario is. The same for Dr. Ghatak, his um, huge expertise in this domain. Um, he will ask him to share some insights with us. Dr. Vidya Gupta is a big reviewer, so is uh, Mr. Ayapa. And so they can also bring you the perspective of a big reviewer. What are they looking at at written uh, proposals as well as as presentations from um, uh, big aspirants? Um, uh, Dr. Akshay, as I just pointed out, is representing Good Food India today. And this is such a niche area where uh, a lot of innovation is currently happening. And he will give you some um, idea about what opportunities are available in that particular domain and what uh, regulatory frameworks you might have to navigate uh, to get there. And um, also, what are the alternate funding op opportunities? If you're in, uh, in the smart uh, protein, uh, smart food, meat alternative industry, what exactly are the options available to you? Even uh, the, besides uh, BIRAC, uh, BIG, and other government funding agencies. And of course, Dr. Parul will give us her uh, perspective from that of a big grantee. Now, very quickly going through this, I will try uh, not to take too much time with this. So I'm timing myself. I'll try to finish in 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, as most of you might be aware, uh, BIRAC's uh, Biotechnology Ignition Grant is a flagship program launched by BIRAC, basically to promote entrepreneurship amongst innovators in the country. Now, one of the requirements of this grant is that you start a venture within the 18 months of the grant period. You are supported up to 50 lakhs uh, to establish, to take your uh, promising ideas, commercial, uh, uh, commercializable ideas, to a proof of concept stage, a prototype stage in 18 months. Please remember that this is not a, a research grant. This is for ideas that have a clear commercial potential. Now, uh, for both indiv individual innovators as well as young startups can apply, and I will quickly go through that as well. By any metric uh, of evaluation, this has been a very successful grant. If you were at uh, the BIRAX 10-year celebration, uh, this time in Delhi, most of the um, highlighted innovators there were uh, either former or ongoing big grantees. And so that tells you how important um, uh, big is in supporting the young innovators in the country. Now, just a, a couple of things to remember. 
uh, for people who've not heard about this grant and hearing it for the first time, uh, please remember that as individuals, even if you don't have a startup now, you can apply, but you have to uh, be focused on starting an enterprise if you're a successful grantee. So within that 18 months, you will have to incorporate a company. And so you should have a clear idea uh, as to who you want on your founding team, what kind of team members you'll be hiring, who will be mentoring a startup and uh, so on. Now, if you are a startup, you should be either a private limited or an LLP, and you should be less than five years uh, of age, and you calculate that age from the date of incorporation to the current call date, which is 1st of July, 2022. Now, just a couple of things that uh, we are going to look for at the initial in eligibility checks. If you're a company, for instance, the PI or the primary applicant project lead who's uh, applying on behalf of the company, should have uh, some uh, shareholding in the company. The minimal am amount of shares is not uh, defined uh, by BIRAC, but if you're not a shareholder, please uh, try to um, uh, get somebody to apply who is. Also uh, try not to have, uh, or if you have uh, shares in a, um, a biotech company that's uh, more than five years old, or uh, you're a subsidiary company of a parent company that is more than five years old, you will not be found eligible for this grant. Now, also there are a lot of uh, uh, information that you will have to share with BIRAC in terms of company documents, your shareholding patterns and so on. For both the individual and the company category, your passport is your proof of nationality. So you have to have a passport uh, and I can go into what the alternatives are should you not have a passport at a later forum. Now I'm keeping this extremely short but uh, for those who are hearing this information for the first time, please don't be discouraged. We will have sessions specially for you. Today, we are trying to get, devote most of our time to have this hear from the speakers. And so I will have dedicated sessions where I will invite you and I will take you through the grant in much more detail. Now for the individual innovators, what you need to remember is you should have completed your undergraduate degree in any stream. And uh, you should have uh, um, identified an incubator where you will carry out your work and have a letter of intent from them. Also, if you're a faculty, a PhD student or a postdoc, you have to get a no objection certificate from academia or the academic institute that you're affiliated with. And if you are privately employed, you have to provide a declaration that I, if you are a successful grantee, that you, will, um, are, that you are ready to devote your time full time uh, to this, uh, to the execution of this grant. Again, the uh, all uh, domains of biotech are broadly covered. Any innovation that has a biotech, a bio, a biology component will be considered. So, if you're coming from a purely engineering field or software field, and you're not, uh, you don't have a distinct biology component per se, you should be servicing at least one domain um, in biotech. For more details on what, uh, uh, the, what domains are covered, et cetera, we uh, can help you. You can also, uh, ha you have a good resource in the BIRAC big webpage where there are guidelines, uh, frequently asked questions and other information pro forma of the uh, online form that you'll have to fill that you can go over to get more information. And in the case of doubt, please reach out to us. Again, the evaluation uh, process for big is quite extensive with a large, uh, rejection at every stage. The initial stage is just an eligibility check. The first actual evaluation starts with your proposal, your written proposal being um, uh, categorized. So under uh, all uh, proposals received by BIRAC are categorized under devices, drugs, diagnostics, industrial biotech, and agri-tech. Uh, and these are the, each proposal is assigned to five appropriate um, reviewers in the field who look at it, who evaluate it, score it, give their comments and so on. And uh, for each stage of evaluation, there is a cutoff. If you make the cutoff, you move on to the next round. After the online review process, the next important stage of evaluation is the presentation. This is where you actually present your idea in front of the uh, our panel of about eight to nine members. And they again, evaluate you based on certain BIRAC approved criteria and give you a score. Again, if you make the score, uh, the final determination of whether you've made uh, as a successful big grantee or not is made. However, if you're not successful at any stage, you're always going to get feedback. And that feedback is going to be extremely valuable for you to work on your project, improve it and come back uh, in the next cycle. There are two cycles a year. 
one in January and one in July. So that gives you optimal time to work on some of these um, um, suggestions and come back stronger. Once you're a, a big grantee, the big partner will take over, release, a be, be in charge of monitoring your pro progress during those 18 months, as well as releasing the funds to you in three tranches. Now, again, please remember that there are eight big partners across the country, and you will be dealing with any one of us throughout the process, but we are not the ones who are responsible for the final evaluation of your proposal that is being done uh, using a pool of BIRAC approved um, domain experts, investors, business leaders, IP experts. So today's panel is kind of um, a snapshot or a snapshot of the kind of panel that will be looking at your written proposals, for instance. They will be looking at it from different angles and to keep the evaluation of the proposal fair. Again, uh, the geometric mean is taken and I uh, spoke about uh, the cutoff decisions. All of the um, criteria as to what the cutoff is, et cetera, is again made by a BIRAC approved expert panel. And you receive feedback at every stage, no matter what the outcome. Again, uh, the, what you see on the screen, uh, the unmet need, the value proposition and differentiation, technical viability, team strength and business perspective are the categories that you're scored on, okay? And uh, uh, besides that, of course, the commercialization potential of your uh, proposal is very strongly considered by the reviewers what to how to address these key evaluation uh, parameters i will talk about in another session and please join me there and i will go into detail uh, but please remember that the unmet need should be critical enough for the reviewers to consider your proposal for funding if you are thinking of a particular problem area so are established players in the market or even young innovators and so you have to differentiate yourself from existing solutions. So you should know exactly what is novel about your proposed approach, uh, why the existing approaches have not worked and how you're filling that gap. Also the value proposition, uh, here we are focusing, uh, focusing on agri-tech and so um, there also the value proposition to the farmer or the uh, stakeholders in the value chain should come out very clearly. The technical strength of your proposal makes or breaks it. So please provide adequate data, um, have scientifically laid out experiments and so on. And uh, Dr. Vidya Gupta will uh, can throw some light on this, how to improve the technical rigor of your proposals. Besides that, the team strength have a well-rounded team with uh, complementary skill sets and the appropriate set of mentors advising you that uh, uh, really goes in your favor, as well as your passion where you take all the criticism, but you come back and you work on the project. You don't abandon it because somebody else thinks it's not a good idea. Again, uh, the business perspective, this is often the weakest form of most written proposals because most uh, of us as academics, we know how difficult it is to think about the business side of things. But if you're an academic in innovator and you don't have exposure to the business world, now's the time to inculcate it. Take the help of your incubator of your mentors come to us and we will help you refine that aspect of your business. Now, just a couple of things that uh, to keep in mind from our uh, experience with the big evaluation process. Again, uh, it's a grant that has a, 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 an acronym of big, so there has to be a bigger pun. So think of the bigger good, the greater good. So when you as an agri innovator are trying to write your proposal, think about how your solution is helping the farmer, um, you know, uh, the FPO, any other, uh, so which, which part of the uh, farm value chain are you, uh, you know, um, are you uh, innovating in? So you need to bring out those value propositions very clearly to each stakeholder in the chain, what are you offering? And where do you lie in that value chain? Also the techniques, uh, so for validation, et cetera, um, if you're going to uh, have to do field trials, all of that should be very scientifically sound and well laid out. Also the ground realities of who you're innovating for and where that solution is going to be deployed. We see this a lot in robotics uh, because um, precision agriculture is uh, very critical for our country right now, but we also have our own challenges as to how our farms are set up. Um, so a deep knowledge of what kind of crop your solution is targeting, what the ground, uh, actual ground realities are, the, um, you know, the, um, the, the ecosystem that you have to navigate around, what are the farmers actually looking for? These are some of the ground realities that you should be aware of if you're thinking of innovating in this field. So to do that, please talk to all the stakeholders, especially the end users of your particular product, 
and onboard the correct mentors. If you're an engineer and you've come up with a solution that is going to service the agri sector, make sure that you have an agri uh, cultural scientist and a person from the industry actually who has in-depth knowledge on, on that uh, advising you. Again, uh, just a quick uh, clearing of the confusion that often uh, comes as to what the role of the big partner and your incubator is. Now, a big, all eight big partners are themselves incubators. And one of the big uh, mandates is that you should execute your project in an incubator. The reason for that is you not only need infrastructural support, but as a startup, you will need a lot of handholding in the beginning, a lot of connects that an established incubator can bring you. And most Bioness supported incubators are there to provide you. All of our participating incubators here are well equipped to provide you with that uh, facility. So from mentoring support to infrastructural support to the handholding and the connects, they will help you all, uh, help you uh, with it. Now, uh, a big partner on the other hand is also an incubator themselves. If you're not uh, geographically located close uh, to your big partner, it is not a problem. If you want to apply through Sign IIT Bombay as your big partner, please remember where, whatever incubator you want to be associated with, by being associated with us through uh, big, you are also leveraging our network and uh, the IIT Bombay ecosystem and the Mumbai, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the industry, uh, that exposure, the market that you would want access to. So by choosing a big partner, say if it is Sign IIT Bombay and an incubator that is close to you and that's uh, adequately has the facilities that will help you execute your project, you're actually getting the best of both worlds. Now, as a big uh, partner, I'm representing Sign here and I uh, head the Sign uh, big, um, I'm managing the Sign big program here at, um, here at um, IIT Bombay. And so from the beginning, from when you have the idea and you want to run it by somebody, you want somebody to read your ground, what should I write here? What should I write there? That initial stage when you're unsure about what you're going to put in your proposal from that stage to the final stage of uh, your product, uh, you know, you're applying for um, uh, follow on funds or you're thinking of uh, taking your uh, product already to the market. That entire stage, Sign IIT Bombay, the big team will be uh, at your side. So uh, please uh, utilize us, uh, connect with me, and I'll be more than happy to help you with your big application and beyond. Now, just a couple of points. I won't dwell too much on this. Again, I will have a dedicated sessions for uh, people who have not written this grant before to how to navigate the grant writing part of it. But just remember that you have to put some work into your big uh, proposal. It is not something that you can submit the night before and have it go through. Since the first layer of evaluation is at your written proposal, you have to have a well-written proposal uh, for it to make it to the uh, next rounds. Please make sure all your sections are complete and all the evaluation par parameters that I mentioned are adequately addressed. Also, data is a very crucial part of your big uh, grant. If you are making any claims about your solution, make sure either you've collected the data or you've collected the data from reliable sources to show the feasibility of your product, project. Again, lay out the outline of uh, like, go through the big performer right away, see what the sections are, what you need to put in them, have an outline uh, ready, give it, give a short, crisp, effective title so that the reviewer just by reading your title knows what you're talking about. Source your statistics from reliable sources. If you can and you have the time and the wherewithal, please kindly do some market research or prior art search to know where you stand in the market. Tomorrow, if your product is ready, who will you be competing with? Make sure all the key matrices are covered in your grant. And as I mentioned, provide any patterns that you've published that show your expertise, highlight adequately your team strength, and provide any data that you might have collected at any scale. Okay, it might be just a lab scale proof of principle, but please include that data if you have it. Throughout the proposal and later on when you're presenting before uh, the committee, your clarity of thought is extremely important. And so uh, take everybody's help, your mentors, your incubators, whoever you're associated with, take their help to get this clarity of thought. Because if you are not clear about what you're proposing, for whom you're proposing, and what the market potential for that is, then you will be easily confused or uh, when you're being grilled or, um, and you're having to defend your project, if there is no clarity in your own thought, you will get easily confused and um, 
not seem sound enough to be able to execute the project in such a short time. Again, scientific rigor is extremely important. Almost all big reviewers look at how scientifically sound the some of the claims that you're making is, the validation studies that you are doing currently or are planning to do. Um, and this involves also your work plan, how well laid out it is and how scientific it is in your in validating uh, your up and coming technology. Again, the commercially, commercial feasibility of it, I cannot stress this enough. You have to highlight that adequately. Again, uh, there are some uh, big approved budget heads and you should budget accordingly. As I mentioned, you can go up to 50 lakhs, not beyond. And uh, within each uh, expenditure head, there are certain caps that you have to respect and keep uh, the amount within that. This is one of those grants that allows you to hire manpower. However, as a PI or as uh, your, uh, any of your team members that you are paying salaries, the salaries cannot ex ex exceed 50K per month. Again, there are some flexible heads such as consumables, contingency, et cetera, um, where you can move the money around depending upon the needs of your project. But please remember moving money from one head to the other will not be, approved, will not be supported without, um, even with a proper justification will not be supported. So please uh, carry out a careful budgeting of your project. Just a brief glimpse into some of the um, uh, big um, sign grantees that we've had in the past. And I will just ask you to please visit the sign IIT Bombay, uh, the big portfolio and look at some of the um, big grantees that we have. Uh, we have a wide variety in uh, agri-tech as well. So we are a sector agnostic uh, incubator and that reflects in the success of uh, the big grantees as well. Now, just quickly, um, you will be asked the technology readiness level of your innovation. And for this and other BIRAC grants, determining that carefully is very important. Now, this is an early stage grant, so you should stay, uh, you sh your technology should be at its early stages between TRL 1 to 3. Uh, when you um, finish uh, your big project, you should be at a stage of 5 to 6. Please remember that this uh, is an, this amount of money and the duration of this grant is not sufficient to support any large scale field trials in case of agriculture or large scale clinical trials. And so uh, you're just allowed small scale validation under this grant. So in your uh, work uh, plan, please do not include uh, such ambitious plans. Again, big is just your foot through the door. Um, once you are a successful big grantee, uh, you, your uh, technology is kind of uh, receives a, a sort of validation and then you are um, more readily accepted into the follow on grants that BIRAC um, has offered. So some of those grants are SIBRI. Um, you can also get seed support through incubators. Uh, in case of SIBRI, the first five, 50 lakhs comes to you as a grant and any project costs beyond that is shared um, in half uh, by BIRAC. BIPP, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no upper cap, cap for either SIBRI or BIPP, and they also support from prototype to validation. So if your company, say, is more than five years old and you can no longer apply for big, SIBRI is still an option for you. Now, for BIPP also, whatever the project cost, uh, you have to raise half and BIRAC will provide the rest. And um, as you go closer to, and closer uh, to scaling up and commercialization, there are appropriate grants for you. Now, for the academics in the audience, PACE AIR and CRS is a good uh, uh, option for you because there is no need for the immediate formation of a venture. And so you can kind, kind of do your uh, industry validation and your research uh, without starting a venture. So for faculty in the audience, please check this out. Again, there is a royalty clause and I'm not... Uh, um, Elaborating too much on this, but once you start revenue generating, you might need to um, pay back 5% till you've met the grant amount. Again, a couple of things that I reiterate at every session, please start your application early. This is a very involved grant, and if you want to write it successfully, you have to start it early. Get several eyes to look at it. You can run it by us as a big partner. And please remember that the deadline on the last day, which is 16th August, is 5.30 and not midnight. Now, there are, a sign uh, provides you with a couple of resources that you might avail. Again, if you want to write or talk to any of us, I will post my uh, phone number in the chat box and you can copy it from there. Otherwise, you can write to my colleague, Dr. Pranitha and I at sign underscore big at sign IITB.org. Also, we have a website where you can check out our uh, big uh, grantee profiles and also our YouTube channel has this and many other useful sessions. 
This is just um, our third session. So there are many more to come. So I will keep inviting you so to such sessions and please join in and ask us any questions uh, whenever the need arises. Now with that, I will stop sharing. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, we will now go uh, let our speakers speak. So if you have any question that you would like to ask the speakers, please put it in the Q&A box and address it uh, to the appropriate person. And I will um, read out the question for him. So I, I would first uh, like to invite Dr. Himendra uh, Mathur. Uh, Dr. Mathur, thank you very much for taking time off of your busy schedule and joining us today. If you could give uh, the early stage innovators in the agri domain um, or other domains, some uh, share some of your insights um, and the perspective from that of an investor. What are you looking at? So I, I just, uh, I'm handing it over to you, share um, what you would like to share with this audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bratati, and thank you um, to uh, the sign team for giving me this opportunity to talk to young budding entrepreneurs. Uh, so I come from a background uh, where I've been investing uh, in the early stage startups uh, across sectors, uh, but my primary focus is food and agriculture. And that's where the, I see a huge potential as, uh, you know, in time to come. If you look at the history of Indian agri-tech, food tech is about 10 years old. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not that we have achieved a certain uh, scale already. I think we are, I would say very, very in a very juvenile phase of the agri innovation ecosystem. And the average age of a startup is just four to five years. Uh, what we are seeing is that most of the startups who are working in this space are trying to solve multi-dimensional problem of Indian agriculture. And I'm sure a lot of the innovators on the call would be aware of it. The first and foremost is access to markets. You know, how do you connect farmers in a very efficient way with the potential customers? Most farmers end up selling their goods in the nearest Monday at the lowest price after the harvest. How do you create mechanism where the demand drives the supply? And that's where we're seeing role of technology, which is enabling demand level aggregation, which is enabling uh, uh, building a supply chain, which caters to the demand in a more efficient way through disintermediation, through more transparency, through efficiency. And, and uh, in that process, uh, you make, uh, uh, you know, you add value to the products, you reduce post-harvest losses, and you make the supply chain integrated right from to the fork. Of course, there are multiple variants in this, uh, uh, in this market access theme. Some are focusing on fruit, some on vegetables, some on staples. So there are startups which are even going into animal protein and very specialized supply chains like silk, jute, hemp, honey, etc. So I think there's a huge, huge opportunity available. Of course, there are some startups who have scaled quite a bit. But I can tell you that this agri-tech is one space where there'll be no monopoly. Like in consumer e-commerce, in fintech, you know, in any urban-centric model, we see a lot of monopolization by top three or four startups or maybe five, 10 startups. But in agri-tech, the beauty is because of the scattered nature of uh, your production and farmers, you can create very uh, specific models pertaining to a crop, pertaining to a geography. And, and that, that can be sizable, you know, without you being given pan India. So I think that opportunity exists. A lot of startups, young startups ask me, you know, so-and-so got $100 million, $500 million. Do we stand a chance? And my answer is yes. You do. And uh, that's my message to you uh, if you're building a startup in this space. Second, we are seeing a lot of startups working on agri inputs, uh, you know, providing farmers good quality inputs at right time, right price. It's very much prescriptive selling where you collect a lot of data on crop health, soil health, um, hyper local weather parameters, and tell farmer that this is how much urea you need to apply and this is. The soil is deficient in let's say zinc or magnesium. So you need to use these micronutrients or what is the right time to spray pesticides. So a lot of uh, advisory goes while you're selling inputs to the farmer and farmer gets the, the right input at the right time. The, so there's a lot of service innovation. I think there's a huge potential for product innovation where I would like some of the agri biotech startups to play a role, you know, especially the spaces like uh, 
biostimulants, biofertilizers, biopesticides, good quality of seeds, plant uh, growth stimulators. Um, I think there is a potential to develop new products. Unfortunately, a lot of Indian agri-tech is digital tech and we don't see too much of biotech penetration in Indian agriculture where the demand side is pretty receptive to it. The focus on safe food and chemical free food and uh, natural food and organic food requires even the agricultural inputs to become, uh, you know, uh, to cater to that demand. And that's where uh, I think there is a huge potential for bio products, you know. So I think that that is another message that I want to give. Can you come up with products which can, you know, uh, you know, improve yield, improve productivity, uh, improve plant, uh, plant, plant immunity, and at the same time, uh, make the crop uh, chemical free. You know, so that's also a challenge statement for a lot of startups. And I think there's a huge potential for it, not just in India, but across the world. Largest of the multinationals and corporates who are operating in the agri input uh, market are looking for good quality uh, bio inputs. Huh? So there's an opportunity for many strategic sale or licensing, etc. Then I think another dimension in agri tech is a lot of focus on data and advisory which is essentially capturing data from multiple sources like satellites, drones, smartphones, and IoT sensor, uh, sensors, etc., and uh, capture the data in a meaningful way and do a lot of data mining, run your, build your AI ML models, which can create insights for farmers and the value chain players, you know, on, let's say for farmers, when to sow, uh, when to harvest, you know, or, and for value chain players, you know, like a lot of banks are using this data, you know, which are the right farmers to give loans to, how to build a risk monitoring mechanism when it comes to crop assets, you know, how do you figure out harvest schedules for loan recovery? Likewise for insurance. So it's not that, the, this, of course, you're in agriculture domain, farmer is a key sort of target customer, but I think the value chain is equally important because they are also looking for these innovative solutions. In fact, a lot of agri-tech solutions in India are a B2B2F, to B to as in business to business to farmer, right? And the, 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 the business, which could be a corporate or a SME or a village level entrepreneur or a FPO, they are the ones who are taking this solution from an agri-tech startup to the farmers. Uh, last thing I want to say that, uh, yes, uh, there is huge opportunity, uh, but uh, we do sort of, you know, look for good mentors, good institutions, good laboratories, good Krishi Vigyan Kendras, which can help you find a new product, which can help you uh, do a lot of validation, especially when it comes to products. You know, how do you validate? If you're making a claim that uh, my product improves uh, yield by 30%, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, uh, convince farmers that the claim is right? And that's where validation becomes extremely important and a lot of sign, uh, a lot of um, uh, Bayrek and big uh, partners are playing a huge role there in validating the model before it can be commercialized. So look for good partners out there. Uh, of course, you know, you want to develop product which is 100% there, but frankly, always think of product market fit. You know, there is always, for a tech innovator, there's also so much obsession with technology and product that sometimes they uh, don't think about the market. So you should always be thinking about it and think that what is the right time to take your innovation to the market, you know. Uh, you know, I think that product market fit is extremely critical for any model to become scalable. Uh, and last thing I want to emphasize, of course, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer connection. Now, big community is very, very large. Uh, you know, uh, as we've seen the numbers, you know, there's so many uh, entrepreneurs who got uh, this grant and there's such a thriving biotech uh, uh, and innovation ecosystem in India. So, you know, you should also do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connections, which call, which also helps. Sometimes even the problem statements are not right and articulate. So how do you get that right? If you start talking to entrepreneurs, other entrepreneurs, I think you not, not just get validation that what you're working is right, but also get a lot of help from their learnings, you know. So reach out to some mature startup, reach out to a startup which have reached certain stage and and you know how they've gone about it, what mistakes they have done, which you can avoid, and things like that. And I think that is also extremely important uh, to for a, for a young budding entrepreneur uh, to you know at an early stage, you know, because each each mistake, but it's not just waste of time; it's also waste of money and resources. So, how do you hedge against that? Uh, entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship by nature is is risky, right? 
but of course there are ways to de-risk your model to a large extent if you do it right so with that uh, all the best to uh, to entrepreneurs who are listening to me on this call and wish them all the best uh, and big is a great 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 program and of course sign iit have been associated with for a long time as done a phenomenal job uh, in driving the innovation ecosystem so you are at the right place at the right time and and you should make most of it thank you thank you dr mathur i'm sure uh, your insights uh, um, and i will summarize at the end thank you very much for taking time of your busy schedule and uh, speaking to the innovators and as um, those of you who are hearing um, uh, Dr. Mathur, today, please, I hope that you're encouraged to apply uh, for this grant and uh, see what uh, this domain has to offer you in and, uh, you know, develop the appropriate technologies that you can get investors interested in, even if you're in the early stage. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, next, I, uh, on the same vein, I move on to uh, Mr. Rajiv Ayapa, uh, he can give also an overview of what globally, what, uh, uh, you know, what kind of innovations are drawing attention uh, at this stage and also his perspectives as a big panelist, uh, what he sees um, and how he, as, as a person in this particular domain and in, uh, through his experience in startup mentoring, if he has some thoughts that he'd like to share. Over to you, Dr. Mr. Ayapa. Thanks, Prasati. Um, first of all, uh, I think uh, Hemant, uh, hi Hemant, we, he covered everything in very clear detail. Uh, there are a handful of um, incubators and uh, big partners in India. There are quite a few of them, but there are a handful who are extremely good. And uh, I, would, I would not name all of them, but uh, Sign IIT is actually one of the best. Uh, so congrats to your team, uh, Dr. Um, I just want to cover three aspects uh, as a commercial person and as a big leader. Uh, the first is the normal tendency for anybody who's in pursuit of uh, scientific excellence uh, and uh, trying to you know, be an entrepreneur of that uh, is to perfect it and then come out into the market with their product. Uh, but my advice is go out there early, have a customer connect from day one. Uh, that's what helps you to evolve your product. You have to be having your ears very close to the ground. Uh, and it's also a very important uh, part of the uh, scoring uh, matrix where a lot of it is given to uh, business perspective uh, and actually unmet needs. So it's important to have that. I think uh, in a different uh, is, uh, I would ask mentors, and uh, your incubator will put you into active mentors from day one. Uh, mentors can actually help you to cut down that. The normal time required, uh, where you could waste time in going in the wrong direction. So that's a, a very important point. Uh, and the final thing that I have to say to all of you is, uh, take it up as a challenge. Uh, whether you get the BIG or you don't, uh, keep trying because uh, we find so many companies who actually get there in their second or third attempt. Uh, besides. Actually, not getting through to the BIG is also a validation because a lot of the panelists, uh, like him and some others, are also investors. And while it might not fit the rest of the panel, you'll be surprised that you might be picked up uh, as an investee uh, by the end or by the time you go through the entire BIG process. Uh, that's all from my side. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm open for the Q&A part of Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Ayapa. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. Um, so next, um, we'll have, uh, I would like to hear from Dr. Vidya Gupta. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, from your years um, as a seasoned scientist, and I've watched you evaluate these proposals, 
scientific rigor is something that you insist on. So when you are re reviewing a proposal, whether it's a written proposal or you're looking at a presentation, what advice would you give uh, to the big applicants? How should they improve the scientific and the technical side of their proposals? Uh, okay, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm really thankful to sign IIT Bombay as well as specifically Dr. Bratati for giving me this opportunity. Um, I come from research background, 100% research background, but I have been evaluating these proposals from the scientific point of view. So I would like to uh, talk about five different points regarding agriculture and allied uh, areas proposals. Uh, the first important point is this particular area is really very, very vast. There are many sub areas in this uh, area, main area. Uh, you can have proposals from plants, crop plants, or you can have proposals from animal area, suitable for animal area. There are devices, there are machineries, there are diagnostics for various stresses, biotic, herbiotic stresses, and followed by finally the food industry, which makes use of these basic um, commodities. Now, even if we take plants or animals, there is a terrible variation. Like in crops, you may have food crops, oil crops, horticultural crops, ornamental crops, floriculture, medicinal plants, and whatnot. Same is true for animal systems. And for all these, there are very specific conditions that are required. The crop conditions, the soil conditions, they are very, very specific. Agricultural practices, they are very specific in nature. The diseases or different stresses like biotic and abiotic stresses, that is the pathogens, they become predominant under a specific environmental conditions. And all this needs to be very well understood when you venture into agriculture and allied areas. Many a times, agriculture is taken very lightly. It is considered as a general topic of everyone's interest and everyone's expertise. But it is not like that. You need a specific type of expertise to write these proposals. Now, uh, the second point that I want to stress is when we look at these proposals, when we review these proposals, I have seen we get two types of PIs, the primary investigators, and the pro these proposals. One is PIs having biology background or agriculture background, those who are aware of some of the agricultural problems. But that doesn't mean they are aware of each and every problem. But they are aware of at least the biology part of it. And the second type of proposals, they need completely different expertise, like engineering, different softwares, um, uh, information technology, or it was mentioned that now drone and different sensors are used and all that. So these different expertise are required to write these proposals. So. What I would stress in writing these proposals is to have a very good team. It is extremely essential to have a good team put together. If you are looking at an agriculture, true agricultural problem, like seed-based problem or the pathogen-based problem, then there should be PI or co-PI or advisor, whatever may be the role of that person, should be completely aware of that problem. If you're looking at the uh, more modern technologies like 
IT based technologies, IoT based technologies, and drone based, then you need to have an engineering expertise in the uh, uh, proposal in your team. Because whenever we look at the proposals, we look at the strength of the team. If the team is weak, that is not considered as a good proposal. We need to have, I mean, normally uh, uh, in the experiments that are done, you want to do everything on your own. But in these proposals, it is not like this. You need to have a good team, good expertise. You need to bring out that for this kind of uh, or this part of the experimentation, this is the expertise that we have. For this kind of experimentation, we have this kind of expertise available. So this team strength is extremely important. That is the second point I wanted to say. Now, the third most important point is the science in these proposals. Since you mentioned about science rigor that is required is because of the vastness of this area that there are so many sub areas and sub sub areas that are present that it is extremely important to understand the science in the project proposal that you are writing or the problem that we are dealing with it could it cannot be vague for specific uh, crop specific needs specific solutions whether it is crop or animal that has to be very clearly understood and it is very essential that we need to interact with the farmers or the market people to get idea what is the problem uh, in that particular system. I shall give you the fourth point is I would give you few examples from different areas so that you will know what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, many a times the proposals are for quality of the produce or the quality of the products, you know. Uh, they are most of the times imaging based, IR based, uh, handheld uh, devices are made. Uh, and those are mostly for ornamentals, for floriculture, for horticulture, for fruit and all crops. But it is extremely essential to understand that the quality is not only the color and shape and size of the fruit. There are many other quality parameters like metabolites, aroma compounds. So that decides the quality. So that needs to be included in the analysis. For big, we do not need the complete proof of concept in hand. So you have to establish that. But for that, you need to understand the problem. Second example I would give you is many times the projects are from fungicides, biopesticides, um, new pesticides to develop. For that, understanding of the mechanism of the particular uh, pathogen that we are looking at, that is extremely important. For example, if it is a root pathogen, and if you say we will have a spray formulation, it is a, I mean, it's a joke. It's not going to work. So you need to understand whether the pathogen is systemic in nature or it is local. All this understanding has to be there when we look into the uh, proposal. Similarly, the time at which that particular solution has to be applied is extremely important. Like for stem borers, once they enter into the stem, into the plant, then whatever solution we apply has no meaning. So the appropriate application time needs to be identified. Same is true for mastitis uh, disease in cows. See, uh, knowing the pathogen in the milk, no use because already the animal is infested with that pathogen. So what is the point in uh, um, testing milk for that? So these are scientific flaws that we see. Now diagnostics, when diagnostics are established, the specificity and sensitivity of the diagnostic that you are developing is extremely important. Whether it is a PCR based, lamp based, ELISA based, lateral flow assay, control. these controls are extremely important. The time at which it has to be developed is very, very important. Same is true for soil analysis. I mean, I have tried to take different examples to just give you the idea what we look at. 
and finally i feel that any technology that is developed is science based there cannot be a technology without this science so unmet need novelty suitability of the technology workability of the technology cost competitors all this is important but if you see really the novelty suitability workability and competitors for all these four points science in that proposal is extremely important so in my opinion science is the atma of your proposals and you have to have complete understanding of that while writing the proposal because this is only a big grant you have to show the proof of concept which is science based thank you thanks a lot dr vidya you uh, said every you covered everything in the most eloquent way and i'm sure our participants benefited a lot uh, thank you so much for summarizing it in such detail and uh, so well so uh, from dr vidya we now move on to our big grantee dr parul um, parul uh, my first question to you will be Uh, you made the successful transition from a woman scientist to a woman entrepreneur now now uh, most of the phd students that we see often are thinking of academic careers are thinking of venturing into their next postdoc but you took this risk and you applied for big so what was your motivation um, what are you currently working on and how has big and this entire evaluation process helped shape your uh, technology better Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you, Bratati and Pranita, for providing me this opportunity for uh, sharing my experience so far with Big Grant. Uh, well, um, uh, to start up uh, uh, my venture, which is called Boviage Research LLP. Uh, as you all know, um, I'm working, uh, um, and I completed my PhD in National Dairy Research Institute, which provided me. Uh, a background in order to understand uh, the kind of problem the small farmers are experiencing in our country so um, uh, during my academics uh, i got to understand uh, as in um, how uh, i can or what uh, would be the solution to the this problem a farmer is facing on day to day basis uh, if you talk about my venture uh, we are mainly focusing on providing um, a lateral flow uh, technology based uh, nanoparticle designed diagnostic which can detect the pregnancy uh, at the st uh, stage of day 21 in case of cattle and buffaloes um, if we talk about the competitors available in the market uh, we have uh, so many uh, uh, companies uh, which provide the solution to this big problem um, at the day um as long as uh, 45 of artificial insemination which in turns create a huge loss in terms of uh, milk productivity so big uh, for me uh, is kind of uh, a great opportunity when i finished my phd program because whole my phd idea was uh, based on solving this big problem but then uh, when it uh, it comes to developing uh, or to uh, produce a novel idea and uh, you are not able to deliver this idea to the field it it goes uh, a, a waste effort so um, after pursuing my phd i decided that uh, uh, i have to shift from academic to uh, the commercial platform so that i can deliver my innovate innovation at the field level to the farmers which is our uh, basic uh, Uh, ideation so uh, that's how uh, in the call of 18 uh, uh, we uh, uh, put our proposal under the big umbrella and uh, as already madam gupta has said uh, that uh, uh, when you file your application you have to be very uh, diligent in terms of effectiveness uh, of your proposal of your title of your ideation how you are going to do this how you are going to deliver your technology your market uh, strategy your value pr proposition all these ideas are really important and i know it was a tough decision for me uh, for sh uh, shifting myself from an academic to the commercial startup but then uh, there is uh, no such thing which is impossible and uh, biorec uh, has been a great opportunity and it it is uh, right now a great 
um, platform for me uh, and I have so far a, a seamless experience being working with the big grantees, uh, uh, big um, experts who are helping me uh, in day-to-day -day basis uh, till now as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. And this evaluation process, how did you find it? And do you have any uh, tips uh, to share with uh, those of, our, uh, of uh, the applicants who are applying maybe for the first time? Well, uh, as everybody has already mentioned, um, uh, before applying to this uh, big grant, uh, one should be very clear about their thoughts and ideas as in um, whether they are uh, actually proposing a solution which is going to uh, put an impact on uh, the agri uh, niche or um, they are just uh, based on uh, some academic experience. So everyone who is uh, keenly uh, looking to apply for this grant, they should be uh, clear in their thoughts. Second thing is, uh, I believe uh, the idea should be novel. I mean, uh, as Madam has already discussed, that it should uh, reach the unmet demand. Um, you see, uh, already in market, there are so many competitors in the allied fields. So one should be uh, really uh, aware about how your idea is innovative and um, effective and sensitive enough to compete with those uh, which are already available in the market. Um, so uh, these were the two most important things I kept in mind by, while designing my proposal. Uh, the uh, uh, practical things which one has to keep in mind uh, during the evaluation of the proposal is um, if you have to uh, get selected in this direct big grant, uh, you should be very clear about your budgeting. Um, I mean, uh, getting a 50 lakh grant is not easy. And uh, using that grant for uh, establishing your startup is really difficult. And for that, you should at least have a uh, uh, homework being done uh, prior to uh, get selected. Uh, if you talk about my uh, 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 startup, we already had a clear budgeting, uh, starting from um, uh, quoting the price for collecting the chemicals to the plastic wares to hiring a staff who can work in the laboratory or in the field uh, to filing the patents uh, for getting the um, uh, patent IP registrations. So everything has to be kept in mind while uh, giving a proposal. One cannot be uh, lousy uh, at the initial for filing an application and um, decide that uh, oh, they can make the changes at the later end. No, that cannot be happened. You have to be very crisp uh, and very uh, sharp about your thoughts, about your uh, decidation as in how you are going, how you're looking forward to establish your startup with your proposed ideas and how you are going to use the uh, incubators facility along with the scientific advisors and mentors you feel like you can incorporate in your um, idea for starting your uh, uh, startup. Thanks a lot, Parul. Um, uh, you, it's, it's like from the horse's mouth. So you just ha heard a big grantee say how much of hard work goes into even preparing the proposal, defending the idea. And then, of course, the actual work begins the day you get the grant. So thanks a lot, Parul. Uh, with that, we are going to now move a little bit away from big. Now, for the agri-innovators out there, um, of course, government grants are a good uh, way to establish your proof of concept, but there are other opportunities available to you um, elsewhere, and you should always keep your eyes and ears open for such opportunities. We are uh, very privileged to have um, Dr. Akshay from Good Food India today, and he will give you a little bit uh, a glimpse of what, he, uh, what their niche area of focus is, and how, if you're innovating in that domain, uh, what kind of support, regulatory frameworks, et cetera, you have to uh, navigate. So over to you, Dr. Akshay. You can share the screen from your end. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Patati. And uh, I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. Yes, uh, yes, we can. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, it's so good to be here. And I'm Akshay Pat, science and technology specialist working with the Good Food Institute India. And uh, the topic which I'll be talking very briefly about today is the future of food, that is smart proteins, and how we are developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply system. So 
basically introduction to the good food institute the good food institute is a non profit organization that is dedicated to accelerating the shift to a sustainable healthy as well as just food system and we are funded uh, by philanthropy and have earned one of the guide stars platinum seal of transparency obtained by less than 1% of the global non profits our organization employs over 100 staff members around the globe with three programmatic departments in science and technology our team of phd scientists work to advance and open source the foundational science of alternative proteins our corporate engagement team builds relationships with one some of the largest food manufacturers in the world meat companies restaurants retailers to help them capitalize on opportunities in the alternative protein and smart protein sector we also provide support to entrepreneurs uh, and startups as well as investors and financial institutions uh, we also have a policy team which advocates for fair regulation of plant based fermentation derived as well as cultivated meat proteins who lobbies with government investment uh, for government in investment as well for sustainable protein research and development so the key question which we are working to address here is how will we feed 10 billion people by 2050 and given that the united nation expects meat demand to grow by more than 50% in that time how will we do so sustainably efficiently as well as safely industrial animal agriculture is among the top two or three most significant contributors to the world's most pressing environmental issues such as water use air pollution as well as, as well as loss of biodiversity it's also a very inefficient way to produce food for example it takes 8 calories to feed chicken and to get one calorie out and that kind of a math is much worse for pigs as well as cows so considering safety antibiotic resistance and pandemics driven by zoonotic diseases uh, something which we are facing currently are among some of the gravest health threats we face today and the risks are basically driven by animal agriculture so we believe the answer to all these issues uh, on many of these issues is to make meat egg and dairy products that people love in the way it is right now uh, and in a more sustainable as well as efficient way with smart proteins we can make proteins directly from plants with ferment or with fermentation technology or using animal agriculture so instead of asking consumers to give up the foods they love uh, the good food institute is uh, accelerating the transition to alternative proteins by helping companies make products that are delicious affordable as well as accessible So at the Good Food Institute, we see alternative proteins or smart proteins as fitting into three categories from a production cost as well as an infrastructure perspective. We can make proteins directly from plants, uh, like I said before, or with fermentation or using animal cell culture. So plant-based meat is, uh, in essence, products that are biomimicking meat using plants as building blocks. They look, taste, as well as cook like conventional meat. The second segment of uh, smart proteins is cultivated meat, which is also referred to as cultured meat or cell-based meat. It is identical to animal meat at the cellular level. It provides the same sensory as well as nutritional profile as conventionally produced meat uh, because it comprises of the same uh, cell types and 3D structure of uh, meat uh, as, as from the from an animal, for example. Uh, it's important to note that it's it is not imitation or synthetic meat. It is actual animal meat grown. just out of the animal uh, at scale it isn't produced in a lab so calling it lab grown meat is also not that accurate and it it will be produced in let's say uh, cultivators uh, uh, the synonym for let's say fermenters uh, for example like uh, a beer brewery so and then there is uh, fermentation which is increasingly being used as an enabling technology for the smart protein industry that allows production of standalone protein sources or functional ingredients fermentation is really emerging as a new driver of plant based uh, Uh, product innovation it is also increasingly being used to create both ingredients as well as a standalone uh, plant based meat products as well so fermentation can be uh, categorized into uh, three three different categories first traditional fermentation which uses microorganisms to modulate and process plant derived ingredients second is biomass fermentation which just leverages on fast growth and high high protein content of many microorganisms a familiar example here is a uh, meatless brand which is called as cone it has been in the market for uh, several decades and they make uh, products out of microprotein and uh, the third is the third segment is basically precision fermentation which uses microbial hosts as cell factories uh, to produce specific functional ingredients such as dairy proteins or egg proteins uh, some of the most famous examples includes perfect day foods which which is producing basically whey as well as casein protein and clara foods which is focused on egg proteins So the plant-based uh, commercial landscape has really evolved in the recent years, from a core group of uh, veggie brands to large CPG companies, and then leading leading meat companies. In addition to large brands that are over a thousand early-stage companies across plant-based meat and dairy categories operating globally. So at least, uh, I mean, looking at the cultivated meat landscape in terms of startups, uh, you can see that how this has. Uh, monumentally picked up uh, in 2015 we had like four or five startups and right now we have 
almost 107 startups uh, and counting. Uh, at least 21 new cultivated meat ventures emerged uh, uh, last year, I should say, and the number of companies largely in life sciences that has been that have publicly announced a business line in cultivated meat increased to 64. So coming to the fermentation category, you can see this is still a relatively young segment of alternative proteins, but rapidly expanding in the last two years, you have seen a step change in launch of fermentation powered alternative protein companies or smart protein companies, bringing them worldwide to 51. Over 80% of alternative protein fermentation companies have launched in the last five years. And at least 70 other known companies, including life science, pharmaceutical, nutrition, agriculture, and big food companies have a business line or a focus area on alternative protein or smart protein fermentation applications. So in terms of India, Good Food Institute India carry out several talent development initiatives. We conducted the Smart Protein Innovation Challenge 2021, uh, where we actually built capacity uh, for graduates, researchers, scientists, uh, early stage professionals. Uh, we had dedicated tracks for both research and entrepreneurship. Uh, we gave access to participants for curated webinars, mentorship sessions, et cetera. Uh, also, we are trying to establish centers of excellence in various top-notch research institutions, organizations across India, launching open and access research grant programs, as well as IP-based grant programs in the Smart Protein. Uh, we're also working towards building cross-country programs for tech, as well as uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, we are also working with universities to launch Smart Protein cur curriculum in universities, and we place ourselves and partners uh, with incubation as well as accelerator programs focused on uh, smart proteins. So these are some of the standout examples. GF and has worked with Hyderabad-based CCMB, that Center for Cell and Molecular Biology, and National Research Center on Meat to secure a 4.6 crore INR uh, uh, grant from the Department of Biotechnology in 2019 to develop uh, meat cultivated from sheep cells. Uh, likewise, uh, the Chief Minister of Office of uh, Office of the Government of Maharashtra sanctioned a partnership between GFI India as well as ICT Institute of Chemical Technology Mumbai to set up a COE in cellular agriculture, which will train scientists, take research product products, transfer technology and incubate startup companies. Uh, through us, the Sanjay Gandhi uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sci Sciences, SGPJ, Lucknow received a 50 lakh grant from the DSD where, uh, where we actually very closely worked with them in 2019. And also very recently, Central Institute of Fisheries Education, CIFE Mumbai received a 66 lakh INR worth of grant in 2021 through the GFI Research Grant Program, which is globally competitive. Uh, we're also actively working with PIRAC under the Department of Biotechnology, which has been funding smart protein uh, startups. Some of the examples are here, String Bio, MyoWorks, Femtopara, as well as zero curve factory and hopefully we'll see much more startups being funded in the coming near future so basically we also have our own grant program that gfi has awarded 30 million towards open access research since 2019 uh, basically we uh, fund open access research projects as well as ip based research projects to improve organo leptic qualities cost as well as scale up of alternative proteins researchers in academia government industry and non-profits from around the global uh, around the globe or the world are eligible and do apply for our uh, GFI annual grant program. We also have a sustainable seed food initiative funds, high impact, which uh, funds high impact research to address critical challenges in, in uh, creating plant based or cell based seafood uh, uh, products. So, uh, just coming to my last slide, I hope that uh, after listening to me, aspiring young talent participating in this session uh, today come up with bright ideas and build their own companies in the sun, sunrise sector. And I would also like to thank Sign as well as other orga organizing par partners for this incredible opportunity to present on behalf of GFI India. So if any one of you are interested uh, in joining us in this mission for smart protein and create inter enterprises uh, uh, in this sector, please reach out to us and we'll be glad to hear from you and support you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Akshay. Uh, I hope uh, uh, funding opportunities in this domain will attract some of you who are working on this domain. I would like to highlight that um, Dr. Akshay uh, had MyWorks on his uh, slide. MyWorks is a sign IIT uh, Bombay big grantee. And he's uh, the, that company is developing uh, edible um, mycelium-based scaffolds for the artificial meat industry. So thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Akshay, for giving them an opportunity to look at other sources of funding as well. Now, uh, we will open up the session now to question and answers. If you would like to ask a question live uh, to any of our panelists here today, and we have some uh, excellent panelists that you should take full advantage of and get your uh, queries resolved, please uh, raise your hands and we'll allow you to ask a question. You can also uh, alternatively uh, type out uh, your question in the Q&A box and we can take it from awesome. there. Uh, 
so um, I, I strongly encourage those of you who are attending. Her parents are getting her crazy. Um, I think somebody is, uh, is unmuted. Kindly, kindly mute yourself if you're unmuted. Um, so I would strongly encourage those who are participating today to please um, ask uh, the panelists any questions that they might have. Otherwise, uh, I'll head that. Uh, uh, discussion. So uh, for all the participating incubators that have collaborated with us for the session, please post your uh, details in the chat box. The rest of you, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A box. Today, to summarize uh, from all of our panelists and what they have uh, been uh, telling us, this is uh, agri-domain is a domain of complexity, but it's also a domain of opportunity. You just need uh, as uh, Dr. Vidya rightly pointed out, a team with the uh, with expertise in the and the you know, sufficient expertise in the fields that you're targeting to uh, kind of refine some of these ideas. And as uh, Parul pointed out, a lot of groundwork needs to go into it. You need to do a proper uh, survey of the value chain, where you fit in, what value you are um, adding to it, as well as a, a proper product market fit. Uh, as uh, Dr. Mathur pointed out for uh, technopreneurs like uh, who are extremely ex excited about their technology, but not really the implications of it. Uh, as Parul pointed out, if you want your technology not to stay in the lab itself, but actually reach the market and benefit people out there, as well as making you money, um, this is the best way to go. And big undoubtedly is the biggest uh, source of funds for early stage innovators out there. It's a, a government grant, despite the royalty clause attached to it, it is still an extremely good opportunity for you to take your innovation closer to market. So um, I don't see any questions yet, uh, but if uh, any of you have any questions, I, I request you to please uh, type in uh, to the Q and A box now. Uh, if uh, any of our participating in yes, Akshay, go ahead, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think Shakti Buddy will raised. Uh, a uh, hand. That, yeah, yeah, a hand. I think yeah. Okay, uh, Shakti, can you kindly ask your question? Uh, Shakti, can you hear us? Okay, uh, so if, uh, sorry, I, I, yeah. Can you see me this time? Bratati, I think you need to promote her to, as a panelist or something for her to ask a question live. Okay, so if anybody is raising their hand for a question but cannot unmute themselves or ask the question live, just uh, type it in. Uh, now, of our participating incubators today, if um, uh, we have Dr. Kamrui, Dr. Mutukumar, Dr. Veena Anil, we have a whole host of uh, people participating. If on from your end you would like to ask uh, our panelists any clarifying questions, please go ahead. Uh, there's just uh, one question about the recordings. Um, yes. Um, also, yes, uh, I forgot to mention, if you would like to get in touch with any of our panelists today, please write to us and um, with the appropriate connections and we will um, make that connection if you need any sort of uh, mentoring for, for them. And for other big sessions, again, I will uh, be contacting you. Now, uh, we had a nice uh, array of experts today who've given you uh, their uh, experience and their insights from different aspects. Yes, Dr. Gupta, please go ahead. Uh, there is a question, I think, in the chat box. Uh, do we need to have basic research before so applying I'll... for the big uh, or an understanding literature point of concept will help? So, uh, Dr. Vidya, do you want to take that question? So, the question is, do um, we need to have basic yeah. research done before applying for the big or an understanding of the literature or, uh, or, or will points of concept? Okay, so I think uh, what uh, Dr. Akshay is asking is how much uh, background information about that particular yeah. domain do you require before you mm -hmm. write in the grant? Uh, yeah. Right, so, sorry, the, the question was from Devi Karani, so I just copy pasted it. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, so it is sorted out. 
No, it's not. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, some basic understanding of that problem is necessary. Uh, both the literature information would be extremely important. And if some basic experiments have been done to show that what uh, hypothesis you are trying to put forth is valid or not, that is more than enough for the proposal. But in that proposal for the big grant, you can write in more details what experiments you plan to do as the milestones, one, two, three, four. So some basic understanding for that particular question is necessary, both uh, literature-wise and some basic experiments-wise. So at TRL one, two, three level, it is okay. TRL four onwards is like already the proof of concept is there. So we don't need really to that level uh, background information. Uh, Dr. Nitya, another question for you. So when um, uh, somebody is making certain claims, we always say that support claims with adequate data have some proof of principle or something. So as a reviewer, when you're looking at somebody making claims, uh, I see that sometimes if the claims are unsubstantiated, uh, that goes against the reviewer. Can you uh, speak on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, obviously, because based on our understanding of this, there are different reviewers in the uh, panel. So each one has different expertise. So based on our uh, knowledge, understanding, and uh, uh, literature survey, um, if the claims that are there in the proposal, uh, they seem to be um, uh, high-handed claims, then surely it is negative for the proposal. Especially for the big grant, you know, you, you don't have to have uh, it's only a proof of concept uh, kind of a proposal. So it is not necessary to make very tall claims in this proposal, which are not I mean, feasible. So workability, suitability and workability of the claim that uh, the PI makes is very, very important. Now, uh, uh, to on all panelists, any of you can take this question up. So commercialization uh, is looking, looked at so strongly, right? So how do you determine whether something is going to find its market and make uh, money in the market and is worth investing uh, the big funds? Uh, you can start off, Dr. Vidya Gupta, and if uh, Dr. Mathur and Dr. I uh, Mr. Ayapa are there, uh, they can take that on. Uh, no, I missed your point. I was looking at a different question, which is to me specifically. Okay, all right. so, so I missed your point. No, Do you can need... go ahead and answer that. Uh... Yeah, because there is a question. Can you read out Vijay. the question? Yeah, can you sure. read out the question? Yeah. Do we need to show all details of manufacturing units in agricultural area? Say products will be organic jaggery. Uh, manufacturing units, at least the um, if you have a prototype established, that is wonderful. If not, at least a good drawing has to be, scientific drawing has to be there uh, for the manufacturing unit. Uh, there is another question from Damianti. If I choose an incubator while applying for BIG, will that still be same after I win the grant and will I be working there itself or can I use facilities at my institution while being incubated at any of the big partners? Now, uh, just to answer this question quite uh, quickly, Damanti, uh, the incubator that you choose for big, you will be taking a letter of intent from them, but you're not tied uh, to that choice. Once you get the grant, you can um, choose the uh, incubator that you think is more appropriate for you for the execution of your project. Um, uh, but uh, however, also, if you want to still have that incubator on board and, um, you know, get into a co-incubation with another incubator, you can do that as well. Uh, now, if you want to carry out uh, the work in the facilities of your institution, please remember that this uh, goes against the big mandate for a reason, because academic, if you work in an academic lab and not in an incubator, any work or IP that you generate as a result might, uh, you know, automatically reside with the institute. And um, Bayrak Big encourages that the IP should be should lay with you. And most incubators allow uh, the company innovating to hold the IP to their innovation. 
and so that is the other uh, other point that i want to make the only people who should uh, not be associated with an incubator but we actually encourage uh, as per the big mandate all uh, grantees to be associated with an incubator because an incubator is not just infrastructural facility it gives you a lot more well established well equipped incubators are not only giving you infrastructural support they are giving you all sorts of other mentoring and other connects that you would otherwise find it difficult to get on your own so that would be my long and short of that answer. Um, uh, Jai Sindhu, can I change the incubator after receiving the grant? Yes, you can. You're, it is not a legal, the LOI is not a, a binding contract. Um, you can uh, choose a different incubator if you change your mind. Can I be part of two proposals? That's, yes, you can be part of two proposals. In fact, you can write two proposals, uh, but uh, it does not always go in your favor because there are only 18 months and if you're spreading yourself too thin by being part of two uh, different uh, proposals or two different teams um, often if you get the grant uh, you'll have to select one of them and uh, so uh, which which will be your focus so it's uh, better to focus on one big project and write a good proposal for that particular project but nothing stops you from being a part of two projects or submitting a grant in two projects Next, uh, to, uh, okay, so uh, Dr. Vidya has already answered the question on the agricultural unit. I will just try to give an example here as well. We had a proposal come through us in the last cycle where it was absolutely in the design phase with just a small scale uh, proof of principle done in a not an industrial machine. And uh, that went through because the person explained uh, the, uh, uh, the details of, as Dr. Vidya pointed out, of the manufacturing unit or the processing unit that they were creating. They explained that in great detail um, to where uh, the committee members who were uh, writing had an idea as to what he was proposing. Uh, Dr. Akshay, is this a question from your end? Yes, yes. I thought I'll just ask it yes, live. Please go ahead. Uh, just a very chicken and chicken and egg kind of a question on the big grant. So I, I heard Dr. Vidya mentioning that some amount of preliminary data is required uh, for, for uh, proving that it's, uh, it's something which is doable. So uh, we get a lot of entrepreneurs who are not based out of any academic institution or any research organization per se, who are working in, let's say, for example, in the corporate sector or company scientists, basically. And uh, for them, it would be a little tricky to get that initial data out in terms of uh, whatever lab experiments would be required and if that does happen uh, that will be also an issue of uh, what amount of data has come out from which lab for example they are working on and what what are some of the ip concerns regarding that so usually what they do is they they usually put, put out grant proposals which uh, you know be as as robust as it could be in terms of scientific rigor and experimentation. So just wanted to ask like, uh, how, how will that be looked at, for example, because we get this question quite often. Uh, yeah, that is also acceptable. If the uh, experimentation that has been mentioned in the proposal, if we think really it is in right direction, that is uh, considered suitable for the proposal uh, it's not that you need to really have the data but for no data at all your literature information as well as the uh, plan of experiment should be really very very logical and reasonable yeah th thank you so much for the answer dr vidya got it Thank you. I think we are coming to the end of our time and uh, I thank all of the panelists today uh, for being here. We would like one picture with all of you. So if you could please turn your videos on. Yes, uh, Dr. Muttukumar, please uh, go ahead. While yeah, we just, take the picture, you can ask your question or make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, actually, though it is not uh, related to the Bayrak, I like to uh, add some points to Ms. Uh, Mr. Dr. Akshay uh, that uh, this um, uh, non-meat product, like a uh, plant-based meat product. Now, recently, the France has come up with the uh, announcement that any food product which is not made with meat can be called as a meat. So that were to be removed. Already in, uh, in India itself, the milk made from almonds, all those things, they should not be called as almonds. 
so it is only a dream so like that whatever the product so we are always welcome that whatever the product prepared for the betterment of the consumer that is always welcome so consumers should have lot of product range to enjoy the, their nutritional health as well as uh, their uh, active life but uh, the uh, the pursi in india though from more than 70 percentage of the indians are meat eaters the consumption of the meat is very less it's hardly a 5 to 6 kg the, uh, the those things especially the green house gas elimination is not related to meat consumption it is mainly due to the uh, stray cattle and other things so we have to concentrate on that one so because a lot of false propaganda is being created that uh, the meat based foods our animal foods are the major threat of uh, the oh, greenhouse gas smart. so okay. please uh, understand that fact yeah, because yeah, we see basically yeah. agrarian country yeah, so lot of people are getting employed yeah. and uh, the yeah. our our yeah, our right, farming yeah. is a small scale yeah. farming yeah. mixed yeah. farming yeah. and uh, yeah. the grains the animals are not fed with grains yeah. like a developed country where they are totally uh, uh, raised on a soil fed yeah. condition with lot of uh, uh, grains and yeah. other yeah. concentrate so uh, the farmers uh, 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 just to be protected that is my okay. thank you thank you uh, dr muthu kumar for that uh, comment i'll just take another question that is there uh, in the uh, q and a box i request all to please kindly mute yourself there's some background somebody's uh, camera video still i mean uh, mic is still on uh, there's a question in the q and a box i have an organism a native strain for enzyme production better results than the literature available based on our laboratory study for pilot scale study like fermenter instrument cost is higher comment on this uh, if the person who's posted this uh, question if they want to ask their question live because i'm not quite sure what uh, you're saying mm, are you saying that uh, you are unable to afford a fermenter that would be required to carry out a pilot scale study uh, if that is the question uh, kindly clarify otherwise uh, it's not quite clear what you're asking there so uh, i would uh, really like to okay with that i think uh, it's time for us to wrap up uh, i would first thank our our speakers for today Dr. Vidya Gupta, that was excellent. Thank you so much for summarizing it so well for the big applicants here. Uh, Dr. I, uh, Mr. Ayappa, uh, Dr. Hemendra Mathur, Dr. Akshay Bhatt, Dr. Parul, thank you for taking uh, your time off of your busy schedules and uh, sharing your insights with our participants today. All of our participating incubators and um, the CEOs who've, uh, who've um, represented them, uh, actually, uh, actually, do, I forgot to call upon Dr. Ramchandra Ghatak. Uh, Dr. Ghatak, are you there? Okay. No, you're not. Turn them down. No, sorry. Uh, I think Dr. Ghatak is no longer there. Um, so uh, I thank you all for being present here today and for sharing your insights. I uh, encourage all of the participants to remember the opportunities in this domain and how Dr. Hemendra Mathur pointed out that despite established players, you still have a, a fair fighting chance. So uh, strengthen your team, improve the technical rigor, find the right product market fit, and right to big, don't be discouraged if you fail the first time, come back a second and a third time with a better proposal. With that, I really thank all of you again, and I call this session to an end. Hope to have many such collaborative, uh, fruitful sessions in the future. Thank you very much.